root words, the rewind. This is all about season one. We're doing a good old kickback, rewind, going back to some of the old episodes to just, you know, figure out a little bit more about our community and people to just tap in on and share this genius that they all have. Um, yeah, so if you're unfamiliar with Root Words, um, it is a short form, short, short form uh, podcast where we kind of just connect the dots with, you know, um, the science, all of the strategies, all of the great stuff, and the people. That's what connects everything. All learning revolves around relationships. And so Root Words is just one way in order to connect the dots. And I think we need a lot of dots to be connected these days. <laughs> it's a lot going on in education. So this is that thing. Connecting the science, the skills, the practices with the people, allowing us to think more critically about what's going on with ourselves, our careers, our lives, all of that great stuff. Um, and I do that through through root words. It's my, it's my baby. <laughs> it's my baby. It's, it's the heart of everything. So my intention, you know, I've said my intention like Oprah. My intention is to, you know, share my insights on being courageous in my experiences as an educator and being courageous, um, broaden our horizons a little bit uh, with Deidre, who's going to come on in a little while because, you know, she's bringing all the courage because <laughs> what she does is dripped, dripping in courageous inspiration, not only for educators, but especially um, black women educators as well. And really in her work doing with Teach Me D, just in all the spaces that you happen to occupy, finding courage to find your power in what you do and what you bring to the table. So I was intentional about asking her to join for this particular topic tonight. Um, and so I'm excited to get into that. Okay, so as I usually have been doing is just grabbing a couple moments and little things that I talked about during the podcast of Root Words during this episode just to share with you to kind of set the stage for our conversation. Um, at the beginning of that podcast, I shared a quote by Anais Nin, and it says, life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage. So when I think about the shrinking of or the expansion of, I always think about like really small children who are just innocent and just fresh, <laughs> like wet behind the ear still. And I think about like that courage that they have, right? Like they just have it. Like, and I know my own son, like when he was real, real little, like, it's like, I see that couch. I'm gonna jump off that couch. It's like quick. Oh, I see those monkey bars. I'm jumping off those monkey bars. Like matter of fact, backwards. Like it was just innate, like animalistic, if you will, like the courage that they have. And then along the way, <laughs> along the line, they encounter experiences, right? And something shifts. That innate courage that they once had starts to sort of shift based on how the world views them, based on how people have been speaking to and around them. And so, you know, that all impacts our self-talk habits. It impacts our self-talk habits. And so I believe that when we think about courage, courage ebbs and flows. Like, it ebbs and flows based on one thing, our individual context right? Our relationships, our environments, and our experiences. That base, That is what our courage is based off. So whether or not we have courage stored up and ready, not just stored up, but actually ready to go and be acted on when we really need it, it all depends on our context. So if we shift our mindset to think of courage as a skill that needs to be, be developed, then we might think of it a little bit differently. We might think of things a little bit differently. So courage as a skill, what do we need to build that skill? What will we need to like really lace up the boots to actually combat negative self-talk or limiting beliefs of ourselves or limiting beliefs that are exposed to us that people have of us? Like in those moments, we have to be able to act on courage, not just have it, right? Like quiet courage doesn't get us anywhere. Quiet courage never gets us anywhere. We have to actually have enough of it stored up in order to be able to use it, right? And so we think about kids, we want them to be able to step up to the plate with stored up, ready to go, skill built courage. What would that take? 
what would that take? That requires us. And I think people like kind of started talking about this in this way of like making deposits into kids, right? And I love that, I love that like visual language. I'm a visual person, so I love applying things to something visual, right? So when we think about making deposits into kids, that means that we'll give them that positive self, we'll give them that positive language. We'll pour, not, no, not just positive. Let's get this clear. Let's get this clear. Hold on, let me take a sip. <laughs> not just positive language, because we could positive a kid to death. And they will not know anywhere to go with what you have told them, but that they good. You got it. You're good. And I was actually talking to my coach, shout out to the disciple teacher. And, um, he was asking me what I need in like moments where I'm struggling. And I realized that in my moments where I struggle, one, I have a difficult time asking for help, but that's a whole nother story for another day. When I struggle, I realized that the people that are around me usually pour positive talk into me. Because, you know, I seem like I got it all together, you know? You got it, girl. You got it. You got it. And I leave those conversations no more prepared to be productive than when I entered into them. I'm still struggling. So same thing applies to kids, right? Like, if we just, you got it, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it all day, they're not going to know what to do with that. <laughs> they're not going to know what to do with that, right? And so what if we teach kids... Because the same thing that works for adults, the same thing that my coach did to me will work for my own son. Like the, it has to. We have to stop thinking that the tools that we're embedding in ourselves as adults is not able to touch kids. We human. Let's go. Right. And so I want to make sure that I'm not only giving positive talk to my son, but I'm also helping him be productive, which means I'm teaching him how to advocate for what he needs in the moment. That's what I learned. So in the moment, I'm, I love that. I love that you believe I got it. I love that. But in this moment, I actually need you to walk through this keynote that I have coming up that I'm stressing out about. <laughs> like, help me be productive with what I have going on. And I have to do the work. I have to have the courage built up within me as a person based on what I have learned from someone that is competent in this area in order to enact action with it in the moment. Enough built up and enough to put out. Crazy. Crazy. Our mind was blown, mind was blown, but everything has to work together. What's good enough for us is good enough for kids. Speaking of, in the episode, I shared five tips. I also did an Instagram uh, carousel post on this a while ago, a while ago, a while ago. You got to scroll, scroll, scroll. Um, on how to build courage in kids and you. What's good for you is good for kids, okay? Um, and I'm going to share those quick five real quick before um, I have Deidre join us. Uh, number one is you might not be ready. You might not be ready. <laughs> Readiness could be a smoke, a smoke screen. Like sometimes we got to go and we might not be ready, right? Sometimes brilliance is what peaks around the corner in those moments that you weren't expecting because you were fearful before you went into the room. So we have to put ourselves in the room in order for us to be able to witness some of those brilliant moments that we never could have expected because these are things that we steered away from because of fear, right? Number two kind of goes with that. You might mess this up. You might go into it and you might mess it up. But guess what? You never would have known if you didn't try. So you have to actually one step in front of the other and walk it out. You actually have to walk it out to see what is on the other side of it, right? Number three is to consider others. And this one I love because asking more questions of kids like, okay, if you do this thing that you're fearful of, this is putting in deposits. If you do that thing, how will it change you? How will it change your life? How will it change others around you? What would that change enact around you? Teaching them to expand their circle beyond themselves, right? You know, it's, de it's developmentally appropriate for them to be self-centered. <laughs> how they learn to be in community with others happen with one, how we model for them, but two, how we ask these types of questions to help them expand, right? Life, what was the quote? What was the quote? The quote makes perfect sense now. Life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage, right? You're helping with that expansion by being intentional with your teaching. With your teaching, you have to be intentional with your teaching. Okay, so not only do you ask them those questions, right? You're helping them not be self-centered. You're helping them get farther, right? We go farther together. 
You have to be able to reflect in order to do that. And it's not to deter people from doing it. Like, oh, consider how someone else would feel. You might not want to do it. It's like, no, no, no. I just have to make it a point to actually consider how my actions impact others. But I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to do what's best for me to do and my purpose and my impact. Okay? So it's not to deter, but it's to consider. Okay? Lead by example. Oh, one more thing. One more thing with that. Because sometimes teaching kids how to be courageous and act brave don't act right. You can be brave and you can be courageous and you can still be respectful and kind to people. So sometimes you have to teach kids when they get that courage built up. And you know when they're young, we have to teach them this early. Like, oh, oh watch your tone. I like that you're standing up for what you believe in, but God, watch it. Let's watch your tone. Let's watch that tone now. Okay, so we have to teach them how to live in community, but that also includes how you say what you need to say. Lead by example, especially for educators, right? How we lead by example in courageous moments. Sometimes we want to be seen as big, bad, king of the hill, queen of the hill. Nothing can stop me, you know? I almost sang, I almost sang the song. I won't do it though. This is how songs, music is my heart. I was, I would recite a song and my students know. I will recite a song if I start that sentence. But just know, you don't have to be the big, bad, know everything, know it all. Sometimes your most vulnerable moments is what sits and teaches students the most. If I come in the classroom and I stand in front of a class and I explain to them how I was fearful of something and I pushed through that, that gives them eyes to see how they can push through moments of fear. And that as an adult, that actually happens. Kids think you sleep under your desk. <laughs> Little kids, especially in elementary, they don't have, they sometimes don't have the vision of how what they're doing is impacting the bigger world. And that what they do now will grow up into a whole adult like you, their vision, their model that they see every day and that they will be able to enact these skills as a, an adult. But they have to see and hear how that works. Boys and girls, or you all, <laughs> you all, right? Because we don't know what's, who's in our class. You all, I was so scared to say what I believed in, but I, I did it. I was courageous. I stood up for what I believed in, and you know what happened? It all worked out. The people around me knew how I felt, and they understood how I felt and we came up with a plan and now everything is going to be much better as a result for the next people that experience that. But I was scared, but I did it. Using that model to actually share with kids is how we move the needle forward. They have to see that vision. You have to give them sight <laughs> and see that vision for how this works and how passionate you are about how we work together. Okay. Finally, encourage questions. Your kids, your students are testing you by how you react to how they ask questions. They are testing your reactions. They're seeing how open you are, how receptive you are, how patient you are when you ask questions. When they ask questions, <laughs> when you ask questions, I'm so into the model mode. I'm like, when you ask questions, they ask questions. No, when they raise their hand to ask a question, they are testing you out. So be gracious in those moments. Encourage questions, encourage inquiry, right? That builds courage and expose kids for how brave they are in moments, how courageous they are in moments to even raise their hand to ask the question. Thank students for asking questions. Let's normalize thanking students for asking questions because that's half the battle right there. If you think back, if you think back to when you were young, think about the five minutes of internal self-talk that occurred when you was gearing yourself up to raise your hand to ask a question. All of that self-talk that happened. So let's normalize thanking kids for raising their hand and asking the questions. Because they're testing you. They're trying to see if they sh are safe enough, if they're comfortable enough to ask a question again. Or if they're safe enough and comfortable enough to come to you when they really need to. When they need you. When something happened outside of school and they really need a trusting adult to talk to. They're testing you. They're testing you. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do to build the skill of courage? Right? Right?
it may happen innately within us. We might be born with something like it that looks close to courage, right? But along the way, our context, our relationships, our experiences, our environments, what goes on around us, how the world view us, views us, changes things. It attacks our courage. It attacks our courage. It attacks our ability to walk our walk and talk our talk. So as the responsible adults with a whole lifetime of skills built up, what are we doing for kids to build the skill of courage? Because that's what we need. That's what we need. Um, if you remember back when um, we were going, we collectively as a community were going through the aftermath after George Floyd, Floyd was murdered, you know, there was a little girl on the news that was doing this protest. No justice, no peace. If you remember, you saw it all over. I shared this with my, um, with my participants and my PDs too, to talk about this because it's a moment. That little girl doesn't get to that place right there, walking down the street, doing news interviews for what she believes in on how we're going to get through this without adults planting that seed of self-advocacy even early, early in her life. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen automatically. Adults cultivate that. Adults cultivate that. And as soon as I saw her walking down those streets, I was like, what, 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 what what's her context? Who is around her? What is she listening to? What is seeping in? That is the magic. That's the magic that we recreate, that we recreate in our classrooms. Okay. All right. So I want to uh, welcome in uh, Deidre while she joins in. Um, listen, if you don't know who Deidre is and you are in this education space right here. I don't know what. I don't know what. You under a rock. You under a whole rock if you don't know who this woman is. <laughs> Hey, sis. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. This thing just came on. I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That wasn't that far left. I was like, and you need to do this. And I'm accepting this right now. It was quick. <laughs> it was so, so quick. But thank you so much for agreeing to join. I know you've been traveling, I doing your been. thing, doing your whole thing. <laughs> and no, I just appreciate you so, 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 so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited for this conversation. I was listening in and taking notes. Um, and so I'm really excited about this conversation. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. Now, I started out um, at the beginning of this series after I was on Library Sundays with Jody, And I love how she does a, a little bit of a different intro of her guests. <laughs> and so I want to do my part in pouring into you my fellow black woman <laughs> and so we can start normalizing just sitting sitting in it right because we do stuff right every day, but we barely get to hear the impact that it makes on others um directly face to face so if you would allow me to just read a little bit of something that i've been thinking about when i was before having you on okay i would love to okay deidre you are a visionary and you are revolutionary. There are so many educators, especially black women educators, that use you as the model to tap into their own courageous power to advocate for what they deserve. When I actually looked up the, dish, the definition of the word visionary, it means thinking about or planning the future with imagination or wisdom. Check. <laughs> Relating to or able to see visions in a dream or trance or as a supernatural a person with original ideas, hello, about <laughs> what the future will or could be like. Mm -hmm. It means things like inspired, imaginative, creative, inventive, insightful, and ingenious. And I just want to say thank you for all that you do in this space. And, you know, as I've said to other people on the live series, you also personally have acted as this sort of prism that I could see all of the possibilities of what impact can look like in this space mm -hmm. through what you have done. And I know you've been grinding it out for so <laughs> many years in this yeah. space and that has not gone unnoticed. And I know everybody appreciates you. Yes, throw up them flowers in the Aww, chat. thank you, thank throw you. I was in the chat for sis, cause it's all deserved. So Thanks, deserved. guys. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, I really appreciate that, I really do. Of course, of course, anytime, anytime you need a just hit me, <laughs> hit me up because you know that's what I was talking about when I was talking to Rakim I was like 
I didn't realize how much I get pumped up with positivity and not like productive talk. And so mm. I know that was something that I took when we met a few weeks ago. It just felt, it felt positive. Us like just talking about yeah. what our role is and our lanes that we're trying to create and our impact. But it, I left feeling so productively inspired and that's different. Than Good. Being, Yes. You know what yes. I mean? Yes, yes. And that's um, a good that's always a that's an amazing feeling when you have a conversation and you leave and you're like, All right, like you're ready to <laughs> ready to rock. Like that's an amazing feeling. We gotta hold on to that. Yeah, especially being in community, right? Because it's like I felt it, but I'm like, we out here is also what I felt like. We are out here. We're out here doing it and like yep. it's gonna be good. It's gonna yes. be good. Okay, so let's get into it. So I have been opening up these conversations with a combined question that I have grown to really love that is okay. a combined question, right? Because okay. I used to ask people like, okay, what do you do, right? And then I realized that it's a much more valuable question, not only for me, but for them, if I ask, how do you serve? And the combined question is, what do you wanna be remembered for? Because, Ooh. right, like they should connect in some way. <laughs> right, right. Oh, that's a hard question. <laughs> What do I, I really, I want to be remembered for being able to just carve out this space where Black women educators are centered, where we are given our flowers, where we are listened to, where we are um, inspired to be courageous and be bold and not villainized for it. Um, I also want to be remembered for just giving uh all educators you know from different backgrounds different experiences just um the to find it within themselves uh to really be the change right we often talk about like be the change and this and that and it's like okay i'm the type of person where you know some, sometimes things sound good like oh yeah sounds good <laughs> but what does that really mean right, right. i want I want to be remembered for helping to give folks the tools to really unpack things and take really sh to take strategic action steps um, from educators to the students that I like my former students, like a lot of the things that I do um, in terms of like coaching and working with educators, um, a lot of there are a lot of lessons that I would give my students as well and really be coaching them on uh, like, like how you were talking about being courageous. Um, I really like I truly this this is hard work for me. And so I've, I've always been one of those people where it's just like, I just can't, I have to do something. I can't just sit back and, and watch this. And I want people to, you know, be inspired by the, the courage that, um, you know, it has, I've had to take on in terms of just being courageous, whether it's as an educator or now as an entrepreneur and, you know, use that courage to motivate, motivate them yeah. to really be the change that education needs. And so um, I'm not perfect, but I hope I hope to just, you know, do work and to and do this work and inspire others to really believe that they they can do it too in whatever way that looks like for them, right? It doesn't have to look like how it looks for me or you or anybody, but, you know, do, do what you've been called to do. Um, so yeah, that's what I want to be remembered for. Yeah, I saw on the chat, they're like, yes, that's exactly what I think about when I think of you. Aww. So clearly it translates. And even like in, you know, with Black Girls Teach and then like the work you're doing with Teach Me D with like social media, it's like that does connect, right? Mm -hmm. it still is the bottom line of Absolutely. being able to walk in that power regardless of whatever space that is that they want to occupy. Like, show up. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what I think of you. Show up. <laughs> you have to. People are waiting on you. Yes, and even when we don't feel like it, right? And that is right. a part of the courageous bit. It's like, we're not always going to feel our best. We're not always going to feel prepared. Like, that's why I say, whatever we teach kids, like the little five tips that I, they're not mm -hmm. little, stop saying little, the five tips. That's right. <laughs> that I just gave, those apply to us. Like, they do. not always going to be ready. We have to show up prepared. We have to do, it, do that work. And so, um, I, you know, I love a definition. I love a, I love a definition. Um, shout out to Jotty who just joined. That's my fellow wordsmith. Hey, Jotty. Out of anywhere. And so courage is defined as the ability to do something that frightens one. And I know, like, I've been tapping into your lives forever. And <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of the conversations that you bring up, it centers the pushing past. So, like, the pushing past that, that fear. And I think 
what's great about like black girls teach is that it goes beyond that. So helping people get to the fear, recognize the fear, but helping them get through it to where they can actually shine and be their full authentic selves in the workplaces that they are, but especially right. what we talk about in schools. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Schools. What else like bubbles up for you when you think of curse? I know you think about it all the time. I mean, you know, I think about um, oftentimes where when I had to be courageous, like just as an educator, um, you know, speaking up about things or just advocating for myself or my students, I knew that there would be consequences. Like I was, you know, initially in the beginning, you know, you don't think that there are certain consequences. But after a while, I was like, okay, well, I know that this is going to probably make me per be perceived a certain way. It's going to rub somebody the wrong way. I may, I may not, you know, my principal may not like me anymore <laughs> because I'm ruffling feathers. Yep. And I just was just like, but I'm going to still say it. <laughs> I'm going to still say something, right? Yeah. I'm still going to say it because at the end of the day, like, to me, like, I just, it's just the it, the morality of it where it's just like, so if I'm not saying something, who is? Or like, who, do we really like, you know, do we care about these kids? Like y'all say y'all do, because if we really care about the children, then this would be unacceptable. And somebody would be saying something. And sorry, somebody's alarm's going off outside. I'm like, come on. <laughs> Don't listen. worry, I can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so like, it would be unacceptable. But it's like, you know, so to me, in those moments, I, f I would feel, I felt like, you know, this is what my students needed me to do. And I would tell my students, right? I would tell them, I said to them one time, I was like, listen, I go in these meetings and sometimes I'm the only one in there saying this, right? Yeah. And you know, and, it, and this, it, do it doesn't feel good. Like I would explain to them how it would make me feel. I would explain to them just the impact it would, I was very candid with my students. Um, I had, they were fourth grader so I was just like listen because I knew that it would inspire them and I also knew that like I would really try to push them to kind of be like like they were little they were they were kind of like me after a while because it would be like no they'd be like Ms. Fogarty no we're gonna say something because that's not okay and I'm like okay Tom bring it down a little bit let's yeah. let's let's think this through let's practice let's yeah. talk about this conversation right um and so that courageousness and speaking up and for, for advocating for my students um, turned into just like advocating for myself and advocating for other educators. Because again, like who's going to do it? Who, who's going to do it? Right. And I've seen so many educators kind of get like, you know, disregarded and walked all over. And it's like, especially as I, you know, as I grew in my career and I was, um, you know, in my 13th, 14th year and I was working with a lot of um, newer teachers yeah they would not say they would not they would not advocate for themselves they would not that something would happen it wouldn't <laughs> feel right and they would just and, and so for me it was part of it was just like modeling for them like no you're gonna I, I, I will say something <laughs> I will yeah. say something even if it doesn't impact me because at that point they, they they knew certain things wasn't gonna fly with me right. so, <laughs> so they wouldn't do certain things to me but I, it didn't matter because I always say like just because it doesn't directly impact me doesn't mean that I can't say something about it or I can't be impacted by it right so like right. there would be there would be points where it would be things that would be directly impacting my teammates um and not me because they they you know they chose to they chose to um you know, honor my boundaries, but I would still speak up and say something, even if I knew like, okay, you're not going to give me a little promotion. I don't want your, I don't want your promotion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making my own promotion. So right. it really, it just, the, the consequences of it outweighed. Like I just, I, I always knew that there would be consequences, but I, I, I truly believe that like, you know, God has given me this gift and God has given me this purpose. So like, I have to, like, I have to, I have to say, I have to say what needs to be said, right? And so if that inspires other people, great, right? If it makes me be denied a promotion or makes folks not like me, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Like, I'm okay with that because um, I truly believe in, you know, what it is that I'm oftentimes advocating for. So that was a long answer, but. <laughs> no, no I'm, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Cause like, it's so funny. Cause we're both here in the DMV. We already talked yeah. about how to get together. And we it feels do. like we were living parallel. We were living parallel lives and didn't even know it. I know, I know. <laughs> didn't even know it. Cause a couple of things that you said, especially in like, 
and this is like it gets to the hard work of this and it's like true for revolve learning as well it's like we're doing the work that we truly wish we had our first few years of teaching right absolutely and so that's what makes us like get so fired up about this because we want to touch especially people new in the profession to really like get to the root of like what you said what you deserve and right I talked about i've been talking about that for the last few weeks it's been a theme that continues to come up no matter what sort of concept that we're talking about because i feel like especially my early years one i was not thinking about what i deserve i was just thinking about getting it in wherever i could fit in here i am i'm just trying to like i'm my little first year teacher i'm just trying to have the class that's on fire over here in the corner right and i inherited so much from what was around me i inherited limiting beliefs of my students i inherited practices that only perpetuated that right going in oh this teacher this veteran teacher is coming to me and asking me about the kid on the roster in the summertime so i must need to go ask the other teachers about who i what kid i should look out for when i haven't even met them right i inherited those beliefs and those practices and there was nothing stopping me there was no no one telling me like hold on pause don't have these limiting beliefs students come with their own context get build relationships with your students because that's the only way you know what they're actually capable of right like nothing i had nothing and so it's so so meaningful and important to the work that we continue to talk about advocating right yeah advocating for what you deserve and understanding that advocacy and self-advocacy is a skill yeah and can i say because <laughs> i mean one of the things too that i've realized with doing this work right it so when I work with educators, um, like uh, newer educators, advocacy, adv advocacy is definitely a skill. I think sometimes the way I look at things is then I start to back up like, okay, you know, let's say you're an educator and you know something's not, not right and you know you need help, right? So yes, we, we want you to advocate for it. But I'm like, okay, we got to back up because let's identify what do you need help with? Right. So that in itself, that in its, and that's what I think sometimes too, I try to help people like, like we have to back up and peel back the layers a little bit because sometimes we don't even know what we need help in. Like right. we're just like, I just need help. I just need training. I just need somebody to show me how to do it. How to do what? What is it that you need help with, right? right? And so that in itself, helping educators to really start to think about, well, what do I need, right? So once you know what you need, then the next step is, all right, so now we need to figure out how we can, how we can go about asking for what it is that you need and also holding whoever is accountable in their job description to be providing you with these things because there's somebody's right. job description and that's right. what i'm like sometimes we gotta look up job descriptions it's somebody's job description that's saying hey they're supposed to be doing dot 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 right is that the thing that you said you needed all right cool so now we need to practice that conversation so those are again those are things that we're often not taught and so I, like for me part of part of this work is because all of those things help you to be because i always say clarity leads to confidence right so when you have clarity about okay what i need help with and now that will lead you to being more confident to be able to actually like advocate and communicate whatever it is that you need right but first you have to be yeah. clear on what actually it is that that you're that is needed yeah and you know i um i think we've also shared a similar belief in even like the competence so like clarity plus competence. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and the work that it that it takes to become competent, right? Yes. Yes. Like our responsibility to be learners of our craft. Learners Absolutely. Of our students, like you know, throwing it back. Like, skip that part research. sometimes. Search again. Search again. Search again. Research. What are you doing? And like, so we can't like skip over that, right? Like we're clean. Once we are around competent adults and coaches hopefully school leaders, right? That can actually help us identify the skills that we would like to build to have the experiences that we deserve as educators. Then it's like, okay, you gotta do some work. Right, like, right. In that space and don't put it on, don't don't take a back seat to your learning and being like, oh, okay, now is my school leader's job only to provide me with what I need. And then being like, at the end, like, oh, well, I didn't get the PD I needed because, you know, they never brought in the people that really spoke to me. Absolutely. My job, right? But that takes so much courage to like, have it be identified for you on what you need, be doing the work and really doing the learning on your own accord as an educator. 
and then going and then like we talked about advocating for a yeah because additional yes because it's like investing in yourself requires courage you know mm -hmm. so because you you have to believe that uh, courage as well as confidence right because you have to believe that like you know you're worth the investment like you're you have to believe that okay like i you know i can get better at this but i'm going to need to uh take this class or take go to this conference and put myself out there be the only person i remember and that's that's how i've always been like my first couple of years of teaching there was like a summer writing pro summer t writing project it was the maryland writing project like a program um for teachers to become better writing teachers but then also to strengthen our own writing skills and i was just like i don't know like this you know <laughs> I, I i just it sounded good but it was like, mm, you know, I'm looking at the course, I'm looking at the, the things involved. And then, so I sign up yeah. and then I join and I'm like, there's like two black people there. <laughs> there's two black folks. Um, and then one of the instructors was black. So I, I mean, I, so it was, a, I, I did not feel a hundred percent comfortable with that number one. So I was just like, mm, okay, you know, but again, it was one of the, the best experiences um, for me as I was in my third year of teaching and all the things that I, I learned in terms of being a writing teacher um, and then also being a writer myself, like those are just things I will always hold on to. And then just the community that was there. So again, but if I didn't have the courage to say, okay, you know what? I need to invest in myself. I need to really like strengthen. I want to strengthen the skill. I want to be a better writing teacher. I think yeah. this is a good opportunity. And even going like when I went there and I didn't feel 100% comfortable because everybody was working in the suburbs and I was working in Baltimore City. And I'm like, what y'all, what y'all going through and what I'm going, it's, it's different, right? But uh -huh. then I didn't allow that to be like the barrier. It was really just like, all right, push through, push through, you know, show up for yourself, do this. And, and that takes courage. Like that yeah. takes courage, even in those moments of just investing in yourself, signing up, like saying, like you're, you're, you were saying, um, working with Rakim, right? With well, shout out to Rakim, like he's an amazing coach. But like that takes courage too, right? To say, yeah. you know what? I'm gonna reach out to this person and I'm going to learn more about their coaching so that I can work on this, this thing that I know I need to work on, right? All of that takes courage. And it's just, it's just, oh, uh, it's just so powerful, right? Because yeah. I think yeah. it becomes, can, it becomes intoxicating where it's like, all right, well, I'm, I could do, I just did this. Now I could do that. Right. And so yeah. once I started investing in myself and really like, you know, pushing myself to, uh, whenever there was a free course or a free training with, when I was um, working in Baltimore, I was there, I was there, I was signing up for everything because it was just like, once I got that courage to do that, it was just like, I, you know, it was just, it became the norm. Right. Right. And you know, and that just made me think about like, <laughs> when you have the courage to advocate, right? Especially to like school leaderships. Yes. Yeah, Bobby, like it takes a lot of vulnerability. And he just reminded me like, in those spaces, we have to feel safe as educators. And especially in the like whole demerit system we even have and experience as educators with like observation, like feedback fatigue that we get when we do actually get observed. If you're if you're a master teacher, you rarely get observed. Like they don't come see us unless they are trying to show up. Right. But <laughs> but in those spaces, like are we safe enough to be seen, even as a master educator, not knowing it all? Like yep. do, are we allowed? Are we allowed to have growth areas and have those areas exposed and not feel like we're going to be taken advantage of. We're not going to be looked down upon. We're not going to be talked about in other spaces, but this is actually a community to grow in safely. Right, right. And that's something I think I have learned the hard way where, you know, we, I think as, I think leaders, like one thing that is so important is to be um, creating environments where there is that psychological safety. And, you know, that's one of the things that, I have as a service for Black Girls Teach, right? And I'm just, I can't wait to work with, I haven't worked with a leader um, specifically yet on that, but I'm like, yo, because it's so needed. But so many folks are in denial. But it's just like that psychological safety for people to be able to like do that. Because I know, I know for me, it got to the point, like I had so many experiences where it definitely wasn't psychological, it wasn't safe, yeah. right? To, to say certain things. 
Um, and I, I, but I didn't realize it. And then I would say things and then, you know, things would come I, like, it would come up, it would come back to me and it'll be a big old thing. And so after a while, it got to a point where it was just like, well, I know, you know, I know that this, it's not necessarily a safe place. I know, again, going back to like, I know there's going to be consequences, but I'm still going to say this, right? I'm still going to tell you, I don't agree. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with what you're saying. Um, I hear you, but I don't agree with what you're saying, right? Even like, so it's, but it, it's really on those leaders. It's so important. Um, and it's oftentimes not a skill that I think is, um, you know, that they are getting developed in, in terms of just creating safety amongst your staff, because, you know, we want to be doing all this DEI work, right? But again, how you how you doing that when there's when there's no safety, right? How you doing that when when people say something and now like you're putting them on a list of teachers that you don't want to be, um, you know, here next mm -hmm. year, right? Just because they said whatever it is that they said. So it's like it's a core element of of the work that we are that we need to do. But leaders are, oftentimes are not getting developed in that area. So I will, I'm going to manifest that. I'm going to be working with the leader this year to develop oh, yeah. and help them in that specific area. I'm oh, excited yeah. about it. <laughs> That's about to happen. That's about to happen. <laughs> yeah. It's in the works. Okay. It's in the works. Yes. Um, I want to talk about, I want to talk a little bit about students and like building courage in students. Um, before we transition into talking about students, um, I I kind of like, you know, I'm a visual, I'm a visual thinker. I'm an abstract visual thinker. So I think about things in this way. And I know in working with the school team last year, um, they were having that issue of like, you know, teachers don't, or they're reporting or nervous. It's talk about teachers not feeling like they can come to us. Like we're not approachable. And this, it kind of goes with this conversation of safety. Mm -hmm. Like they don't feel safe. And the visual that I gave them was like, what, is the approach. Are you on the same side of the table or do you always approach them from the opposite side of the table? And it's very clear. We're in there. We're in your office right now. So, but how does it feel? Do they always feel like you're across arms crossed, make it make sense? Or right. are you pulling up beside your teachers and saying, okay, I hear you. Like, how does it feel when you are sitting beside someone versus across from them or to two totally different things? Absolutely. You know, and absolutely. So, and then if you think about it, when they do come in, keeping the visual, do you have everything all over your desk to where they don't feel comfortable coming in, sitting with you and tackling a task together because you have all this other stuff and you're asking them to put, you're asking them to put something else on this desk that's just overwhelmed already. They know you're not going to see their little paper over there amongst everything else. Mm -hmm. so are you creating and setting the stage when you meet with teachers that makes them feel like you have cleared this desk off? And you are open and willing and beside them to them for them to sit something on the table and you both have the space and the clarity to actually look at it and tackle it together. Right. And I think too, like, I also think that like leaders reflecting on like, well, what, what is your, what are your next steps when a teacher is not up to par? Right. What are your, mm -hmm. when, when you have a teacher that's coming to work late, when you have a teacher that's not turning in their lesson plans, when you have a teacher that is just, you know, going off script, what are your next steps, you know? Yeah. Because if your next steps are immediately to go into your compliance, your compliant, like, okay, exactly. I, like manage your, like, if that's your next step versus, you know, hey, like, I, like, what's, what's, is everything good? Like, what's yeah. going on? I just want to talk to you. I want to see what's, What's up? You know, what's up? You know, I noticed you haven't been turning in your lesson plans and, um, I, you know, I went into your class and you were doing something different. Like, what's what's up? What's what's happening? Right. Yeah. You know, and just coming from a place of like, well, let me let me find out what's going on so we can try to determine is there coaching that you need? Is there something that I can? <laughs> Sorry, that's so funny. <laughs> this, this, these are my chains, but you know when I put this chain on, I was like, "Dang, this is like Rakim's chain." <laughs> oh my god! I didn't think about it. Chains. I didn't think about it until I read it. I didn't think about it until I read it. But I did think about it when I put it on. I was like, "Let me, let me, let me get my Rakim chains out." <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, no, that's the community for you. That's the <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Listen, so like the thing is though, like. I think a lot of leaders lean too heavily on um, 
you know, the, the compliant, like making sure that you're following these rules um, versus let me coach you. A lot of leaders don't have the skill set of coaching where it's like, and it's open. And the thing is, right, you can still have a balance, right? I can hold you if you're coming late to work, right? I can hold you accountable, but I can also determine what is happening, right? And just give you some quick tips about like, all right, well, if you know that this is happening or you're running to feel like you, you know, and sometimes we think as adults, adults supposed to know that. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, no, sometimes we have some, some of our, especially our early career educators, like a lot of times this is their first real job. Right. And they're not. And that's a whole thing in itself, like going from being a, a college student to now you are professional. There is not professional development often to, to, to fill that gap. Right. So it's like, I mean, you know, those are skills that have to be taught as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> they like, you know, as school leaders and then on our end as educators, like. You you want to be kept. <laughs> on both sides like if your mindset first is to coach that's how you keep absolutely that's how you keep people period my, and if my mindset is that i will be coached you will keep me you will keep me because i see value in where i am i see i see that i'm not only valued but you value me, my growth and where i'm going right you value where i am right now and you value and you see my potential for where i want to go and that is gold in learning environment so if you're not in an environment that fosters that you got to go yeah because i mean like <laughs> not, like it's, it's it's one thing where you know um let's say you haven't been doing something that you're supposed to do and you know you got an email like um i noticed that you haven't submitted and then you get a whole list of all these things that you haven't submitted right with the dates attached to it and versus like again like hey you know I'm, i noticed that like there's some deadlines coming up or deadlines that have passed and I haven't gotten some things like what you know is everything what's going on like because again not everybody's coming in with all the skill sets that you need to be able to manage a schedule or multiple deadlines and some of us are just not good at those things right mm -hmm. and so part of being a leader is realizing that you know there are going to be some people that maybe they're going to need some coaching on how to just like balance the different deadlines that they have or maybe i need to evaluate especially right now in this in this space we're in education maybe i need to think about all the different things i'm assigning to my staff do they need to have all of those things but a lot of times we're just going we're going to the compliance part where we're just like here are the things that you versus just coming up to me and saying hey is everything all right you know, I haven't been getting a whole bunch of stuff from you. <laughs> like that's when I was yeah. a coach and my teachers, uh, they were, weren't doing something. I'd be like, um, what's good? I haven't gotten some stuff. Where, where's right. it at? What's, what's happening? Uh, and they would always tell me like, you know, Fogarty, this and that. And I'm like, all right, cool. Well, let's, let's sit down after school or whenever during our planning time and let's make a plan on how we can, we can get these things done. Cause I want to make sure that I'm, if I need to coach you on that versus instruction, then that's what I'm going to do. Right. Cause you're considering character. You're considering right character and the humanity of a person over compliance yeah yeah right? that's and that's how you keep teachers approach. right that's that approach it's just like it's not about the compliant list over who you are as a person because i saw something in you as a person that made you, me want you to join this community of right work, right so your character means that this ain't you so something's going on and let me help and two things can happen at once. I could be an amazing teacher, but I can also be someone that is going to turn things in late. <laughs> Ability, okay? I'm a great teacher, though, but sometimes <laughs> things are going to be a little bit late. But uh, help me work on that, okay? Like, that's that's absolutely... So then, as a leader, you're like, all right, cool. Like, we can work with that. We can work with that. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Okay. So, this is the last one. Um, and I wanted to just talk really quickly about kids because I had this super revelational moment when I was a teacher and dealing with courage. I talked about this on the podcast. And it was the moment where I realized that I am only a contributor to the building of what the character of my students. I'm a contributor, 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 right? No matter what I'm talking about, in this case, courage, right? I always say we don't, you don't make kids smart. You don't make kids courageous like you build it within them they already yep. have it we build it up right and so i realized I'm, I'm a contributor i'm not the publisher on what they're going to become i'm not the editor on what they're going to become none of that i am contributing to what they'll become and i realized that when i had a kid that was super below grade level in reading i came up with this whole elaborate plan on how i was going to catch him up right and in the conference the parents came in in the conference 
and I laid everything out. I was excited, like stayed up all night. Like, this is what we're going to do here, 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 here. And he's going to get him caught up by quarter three. And this parent told me, the father told me, you don't even got to worry about all that, Ms. Reed. He going to the league. Hmm. And I was like, <laughs> okay, okay. And you know how you have, to, you have to put on that face mm -hmm. <laughs> in that moment? You're going to have to muster up a whole lot of courage to, one, combat everything that you're feeling to, like, put on the face. Right. Well, this is what my responsibility as his teacher is to do and perform to my best ability so that your son can read to the best of his ability. That's, this is what this is. This is what the plan is. But in that moment, Deidre, I realized that students are faced with so many conflicting perspectives. Right. Right? Their teacher is here pouring into them about all they can be academically, social, emotionally, all these things. They can go home and have the limiting belief put on them that they are good at sports alone. And to, be, and to say that in front of your child to his teacher, you don't have to worry about none of this because you're going to the league, right? The courage that it would take for a kid to even speak up in their own families, right? any other aspirations, desires, talents to be leveraged when you have your family saying or the world saying that you're only good at this. Mm -hmm. And the plight of being an educator to actually understand that your students are going to be shifting and moving through all of these opinions and perspectives. Like, what do you teach students in terms of who they are, whose they are, <laughs> you know, in order to build the level of courage to where when they become old enough to speak to what they want and what they desire, they actually have the tools, skill, and academic prowess to actually be able to maneuver in the spaces that they want to maneuver in. And so that was just really revelational to me, like, I still, it made my job so, that much more important. Yeah. Like, I, I skipped into work extra hard the next day. Like, wow, the conflicting beliefs on our kids is. Yeah, my, that like, that is so true. And I'm glad you said that because like, this is something I haven't really thought about, but it's so true, right? Because oftentimes we are, as educators, we're talking to our students about all these different things. Um, and then, you know, they may go home and get a different, a different message. And even yeah. something as <laughs> I know, like when, with my students, you know, we're telling like, this is a small example, but like, if I'm saying to my students, like, we don't hit people, we don't do that. We don't fight. We don't, you know, I'm like, when somebody hits you or somebody does something to you, let me know so I can handle it. Right. Yeah. Then mama's saying, if somebody hits you, you better hit them back. <laughs> right. <Exactly. laughs> Right. And then it's like, uh, and then the kid's like, well, my mother said, if somebody hit me, I got to hit them back. Right. But you're saying it, right? And so like, but again, there, and then that's one example, but there are so many different messages that our, our students are getting um, from their families, from us, from their friends. And I think really it's about giving, the, having those conversations where like, I, again, I was very like, I would have moments where my students are, I'm like, all right, time out. We're going to stop everything we're doing close the door let's talk yeah. right because yes. because i mean you're gonna and i would say to them you're gonna have moments where people are going to be trying to convince you to do all these different things what are you going to do in those situations miss Fogel, you're not going to be there your mother's not going to be there you're going to have to be the one to make the decision that is best for you right and yeah. so give yourself that space to just pause you know, try to think about what the best thing is to do, but you don't have to just like make a decision right away. So like anytime, I think for me, a big thing was like those teachable moments. Mm -hmm. And I know like now sometimes there's curriculums where, where, you know, social skills and things of that nature, what always worked for me was teachable moments versus just teaching a specific social, social skill in isolation. Right. It was more of like, all right, hold up let's let's talk about what just happened here right um even something as simple when uh, my students we were they were eating lunch and they were like Ms. Fogarty, i'd rather starve than eat this lunch and i was like what and they're like look at it it's, it's nasty right <laughs> it's and, like courage to eat the lunch <laughs> right right and then one student was like well you know that's why i always bring my own lunch and the student was like well i can't do that like mm -hmm. i'm supposed to get this lunch here and it's nasty and i'm always hungry and i'm like okay so hold up all right so, and I looked at it and I was like, I agree with you. I think yeah. that this is the only time I like only on hot dog day, I'll get a hot dog, but that's it. <laughs> the yeah. other days I'm like, no, I can't, no, I wouldn't do that. 
But I'm like, all right, so let's think about how we can, how can we solve this problem? Like, who do right. we need to talk to? Who do, what, what do we need to, you know, like, and so we ended up scheduling, he scheduled a, a conversation with the, one of the, the business, someone who is over the lunches and that person, you know, it didn't necessarily change the lunches, but they learned more about the processes of like, who is the vendor and the vendor sends the lunches and things like that. Right. And so we tried to problem solve, okay, how can we, how can we figure this out? When we look at the calendar, can we see what days we might not like it? Like, what can we do? Right. The food quality is a huge issue. And I was saying, sorry, <laughs> side note, I was talking on the other Instagram live about being a problem solver. Like, you know, a lot of the kids in the suburbs, they, their food is uh, is great. It's amazing during the, the lunch. I, I, my my nephew's school, their their lunch is amazing. Why isn't that the same for for the students that are living in our low income communities? It ain't the same. They the lunch the lunch option options are horrible, and that shouldn't be the case because our students deserve to have you know quality lunch. But right. anyways, but again, it's like to using those teachable moments to be able to just show students how to advocate for themselves. I would teach my students. They would switch different. My students, I had special education students too. Mm -hmm. So they dealt with a lot of different things in terms of, because I would pull them out of class, they would be in my room and they had to deal with a lot of different things in terms of just like, you know, being identified as a student that has an IEP. So my thing was like, number one, I'm going to teach you how to ask for help. I'm going to teach you how to like shut somebody down when they say something to you about having an IEP. I'm going to teach you how to, if your teacher tries to put you on, because I would have it where the teacher sometimes would, they wouldn't know what to do with them when they came back into the room and would put them on the computer and just get on something random while they finished up a lesson. No, you're not. You're going to go to the teacher and say, hi, what is it that you're working on? Because I'm trying to, I want to catch up and do what y'all are doing. Not right. about to just put me on a computer and put me in the back of the room. And right. so I had to teach, because I knew for my students in particular, they, they oftentimes are neglected and overlooked. So that means I need to teach you the skills to ensure that folks are always going to see you. Like, because it's, it's, it's very easy for you to sit in the back of the room and people to forget about you. But you have to, you have to show up for yourself. You have to, and, and I would even teach them, like, sometimes they, they would have a teacher. I remember one time, like, she, you know, she went, she, like, got down and got in their face, got in that student's face, and the student didn't like that. And I'm like, okay, well, you're going to tell that teacher. Like, you need, let's practice, right? Because yeah. no one should be getting up in your face like that. Right. No one should be doing that to you, especially not her, right? So I, you know, we had to, like, we had to plan out how that conversation was going to go. What are you going to say to her? How are you going to say it? And then you're going to have this conversation because unless you want her to be coming up in your face again, because you can't just run because the student ran to me in my room um, to, and crying, upset. But I'm like, that's not, I'm not, I'm not going to solve this problem for you right now. I'm yep. going to give you the skills to, to solve it. I did talk to the teacher because I was like, that's, <laughs> Like that's my baby. You're not about to be <laughs> like no, no, no. But you know, like giving those giving skill those skills to the students and like and actually seeing that just as important as the academic skills. I think that's that's part of you know teaching them how to be more courageous. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is to wrap us up. To wrap us up and to connect a couple dots. Okay, this is what I mean by adult adult skills, advocacy, all of our higher order skills that we like talking about is just as powerful for kids. If it, it works for adults to advocate for their pay, advocate yep. for their experiences, advocate for what they deserve, students can do it too. If we approach all of these things as skills to be built. And that's Absolutely. what you do. What you do with Black Girls Teach, what you do with TGD, all of those things are aligned to what you did with kids directly. Yeah. You're using the same, the same tactics, the same thought process, that you would use to coach a school leader or coach a teacher or coach the empowerment circle that you did with your students because what works works right absolutely you know we're not changing anything the same things i do with teachers now i did with my kids because we prioritize what we need that skills we prioritize joy we prioritize talking about the real issues and connecting to our bigger purpose we not just learn in math we not just learn and read. Yep. And you know, I used to like, like connecting the dots is so powerful for kids. I get so amped about it. Cause <laughs> I'm a, this is, I'm gonna, let, I'm gonna let you go. I'm gonna let you go, sis. But one of my most powerful moments was when a kid asked me like, oh, you know why we gotta read? And I was like, you know why we have to read? <laughs> you know why we have to read? And you know why I read personally? To talk about it. 
Like, yes. On the, I was on the Metro and I was reading this article yesterday, right? And then I called my friend and I told her all about it. She got so amped up about it. We went to dinner and was talking about it. And then she called her friend and was talking about it. I was like, it is so interesting. But the best part about reading is sharing what you learn. Can, can I say something? Because this is crazy because this is what I would always say to that, right? I would say like, okay, imagine you go to a party, right? And everybody's <laughs> talking about this thing. They're talking about, they're like, ah, da, 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 da. and they're like, what do you think? And then you're like, you don't know what they talk about. How do you think that's going to feel? When you're the only one that doesn't know what they're talking about because they've been, they've been reading books, they've been reading articles, they've been watching the news, they know what's going on, but you sitting there, you don't, you don't know, you don't know what's going on. And like I told them before, like, I would say like, I've had, I've had experiences like that where I'm the only person where I'm like, huh, what, what, what happened? <laughs> Cause I didn't know. And I don't like that feeling. Or when somebody's using a word and I got to write the word down and pretend I know what that word means. But I'm like, nah, I don't like that feeling. And right. then they're like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, and to me, I know as a, that's helped me like really, really say like, all right, I need to read more. I need to study words more because when I get in situations in rooms, I want to know what people are talking about. I don't want to feel like I'm the only one that doesn't know what's going on. So right. that that's how I would explain it to them. So yes. it's like kind of similar to yours. But like, it's not uh, even about reading the same thing. It's being able to read something to contribute to the conversation. Yeah. Like yeah. you're, you're going to share something you read, but you're going to be able to make these connections and be able to participate in these spaces because of being a reader, because yep. of being a learner and loving to learn new things all the time. And it never stops. Absolutely. Reed loves learning new things even now. And I'm a teacher. Yeah. I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> it never stops. It's still the jam. You'll yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. Oh, thank you so much. This was so, so good. Yes. This was so good. Um, I love talking about these things. Um, and, you know, I'm gearing up towards season two of Root Words, doing 10 new words. And I'll be back with more lives doing uh, Word of Wednesdays while season two is being released and then bringing back, you know, the rewind after that. But I am so, so grateful for you, sis. You add so much expertise and sauce. <laughs> <laughs> I try, I try. Work, you, know, you know, this is what is real. It's being able to do this work with like real, real people. You yes, know? absolutely. It's necessary. Yeah, yeah, necessary. yeah. All right, sis. And I know we have... Um, Dr. Chris Emden over there with Bobby. So I'm going to jump over there and <laughs> soak up some more, soak up some more. Yes. Some more, some more. But we will definitely connect soon. You know, we have okay. a lot to do. And it doesn't make any sense for us not to because we're like up the street. Right? I know. We <laughs> have to go to like happy hour and just be, do some plotting and planning. <laughs> they, won't, they, they won't know what hit them. We get people. That's Listen. Like, we can't let them keep us apart. Cause <laughs> Listen. You know. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. I hope you have a great evening. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.